guest today is my dear friend and fellow church member, Dr. Ben Mast, who's the chair of the psychology department at the University of Louisville. Ben's a world expert on dementia and Alzheimer's, and we had a great conversation talking about these important issues. Uh, I am almost out of gas, which is really bad timing. I My production <laughs> crew failed me, which is me. Uh, um, but anyways, so welcome. Um, what was your first car, Benjamin Todd Mast? Uh, the first car that I had was an Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. Nice. It was bright and reddish orange. Uh, nice. It was the, uh, the pride of my 16-year-old year. So yeah. Do you know what year it was? Uh, it was a 1980. Okay. Yeah, so it big. Was, so what year are you talking? Did you have it? Oh, what year? So that must have been um, 89. Okay, so it was nine years old already, but it yeah. was a big old beautiful boat. Of it was big and beautiful, except for the rear bumper was totally rusted out okay. and uh, we didn't replace it until we sold it and I can't understand why we just waited. <laughs> that's how it goes. Clean the house before the maid comes over. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so how did I get into clinical psychology? Uh, that's the longer story. Let me answer the short version okay. yet. So a licensed psychologist is just a person who's been trained in psychology who meets the state requirements to be able to practice psychology. So, and what does practice psychology mean? Does that mean? can mean uh, assessment, psychotherapy, okay. counseling, psych consultation. Uh, anytime you are uh, seeing clients who are coming to you in uh, okay. various forms of distress or needing diagnostic clarification or okay. uh, anything of that sort, sort of the traditional yeah. psychologist tasks. And so I actually started out in social psychology, interested in aging, uh, I was interested in uh, changes in identity and selfhood among people with cognitive impairment and okay. dementia. Is aging a subset of social? Nope, aging cuts that... across all of them. Oh, so okay. um, right. and aging concerns gerontology, which is really a multidisciplinary field that involves psychology, sociology, economics, mm -hmm. public health, et cetera, biology. And I had gotten into that because I had done some work with people who have dementia and other memory problems uh, after I graduated from Calvin College with my undergraduate okay. degree in psychology. Um, and uh, just really felt during that work, I was at a um, an Alzheimer's Day Center where I just spent all day every day with people who had various forms of cognitive impairment. And we did everything from uh, going bowling, going to Ryan's Steakhouse to uh, <laughs> Uh, personal like, care, you know, helping yeah. people figure out the next step to do in the bathroom. My perception yeah. is that there weren't Alzheimer's units or right. as much in, in probably the days you were training. That must have been on yeah. the earlier end of one, is that correct? Yeah, so I, this was uh, probably 96, 97. Okay. Uh, actually, 95, 96. But um, yeah, so there was awareness of Alzheimer's disease at that time. I think Alzheimer's research really grew in prominence in the 1980s. Uh, oh, but, okay. So. But certainly it wasn't as well recognized as it is now. Okay. And uh, people now are diagnosed so much earlier. It seems much more widespread. There are okay. more people with it. Um, but that was really where I, I felt called into yeah. working with older people, especially with cognitive changes. And yeah, yeah. So after a couple of years in that PhD in social psychology, I realized I didn't I wasn't getting the training I needed to do the type of work that I wanted and I needed to get clinical training and assessment uh, because a big part of what psychologists do in the realm of dementia care is on the diagnostic side, so memory testing, uh, cognitive uh, right. evaluations. I needed those tools. I needed the neuropsychological training to understand what's happening in the brain and how it affects behavior and cognition. By Gary Burge that I use in my higher education class about mapping your academic career. You've told me about yeah, that. that last stage is so such a dangerous one where people that have all the wisdom and resources have just become cynical and don't care anymore. Yes. You know, which yes. is a personal problem, but it's also an administrative problem. That's mm -hmm. kind of part of the takeaway is that you've got to capitalize on that. Yeah, that's a really you good know. point. I can see that. Siri, give me a number between 15 and 167. Okay, that was a fail. Hey Siri, 
Give me a random number between 15 and 167. Really? <laughs> okay, good thing we got this. Usually I don't have this server. Well, maybe it's Siri. Hey Siri. Give me a number between 15 and 167. Okay, page 140. Would oh, you mind geez. turning to page 140 and reading a paragraph out of there for yeah. us? This is from my book, Second Forgetting, okay. yes. Uh, so this is a section on uh, communion in a chapter on remembering the Lord. Okay. Uh, even though people may forget explicit information and be unable to explain what communion means, there's a good possibility that they implicitly remember how to take communion, since the procedural and emotional memory systems may be spared. Again, the benefit is in the moment. Those receiving communion will likely have some recollection of what it means and why they are doing it, even if they cannot communicate that fact directly. Okay, you want to say something about that? Put that in its context in the broader yeah. argument of the book? Yeah, like um, so the, the book is uh, concerned with uh, the problem of forgetting in Alzheimer's disease and, and specifically what that means for people of faith and Christians and uh, how do they respond to God's call to remember him um, in both good and bad times. And uh, when we look at Alzheimer's disease and the, the particular problems that people have with memory, uh, we've done a good job in our field emphasizing what kinds of things people forget and where their deficits are. And, and so this particular chapter seeks to take the scientific literature that describes both strengths and weaknesses in memory functioning for people with Alzheimer's disease and applies it to how we, uh, as a church, uh, broadly construed, uh, can help people remember the Lord, um, other than asking the very difficult question, do you remember this, yeah. do you remember Which that? Which is a big part of your, the practical import of the book, is yeah. don't, that that's such a natural thing for us with an elderly person or someone with dementia, do you remember this, do you remember me? Yes. And that's like, I got, that's like one of your number one things, that's don't That's one do of that. the number one things. Because it's just stressful do. to them, is that? It's, it's stressful, right? and when we ask people, when we put people on the spot, you mm -hmm. know, do you remember when they, they clearly have memory problems. I think we're asking more for our benefit than for mm -hmm. them. We, we want to be remembered. We want to be meaningful and important to them. But you know, recent and new information is the hardest for them to remember what we would call their explicit memory systems, memory for what happened this morning, uh, memory for the names of new people. When we say something is like riding a bike, uh, you're referring to procedural memories. Right, you never right. have to think about how to do it. You just walk up and... And those last longer from what I gather. They, from what you're, they definitely yeah. last longer uh, for people with dementia. And so this section talking about communion is really talking in a broader sense about uh, the various practices we have as a community um, of, of people following the Lord, whether it is uh, repetition of songs that we've known for decades, maybe old hymns uh, within our particular traditions, or well-known prayers or even creeds that maybe the person has recited hundreds right. of times. Uh, likewise, communion is, can be an act of remembrance, which is certainly how Jesus describes it yeah. um, in his initiation of the practice. Uh, can be something that prompts people to remember the Lord in a different way than asking them if they remember Jesus. Yeah. So that's what this, this yeah. short section is about, is how can we engage people who have memory problems in a way that helps them remember the Lord. What are some things the church can do? I mean, you kind of mm -hmm. mentioned that, but maybe corporately or individually, what can the church do to help people with dementia and Alzheimer's? Yeah, I think there are, there's quite a few things we can do, and uh, there's really no magic bullet that's going to make everything okay and so you know we need to think about it as coming alongside people uh, in the midst of what can be suffering you know not everybody with dementia suffers um, but I think there's things we can do corporately in the church building um, whether it is uh, you know rethinking the way that we do our services you know so like what let me think about uh, the average church service and so uh, think about issues of how crowded it is. Um, if it's very crowded, it's going to be harder for a person with memory problems to navigate. Uh, how loud is it? 
Uh, very loud services can be uh, overstimulating for people yeah, with cognitive absolutely. changes. Um, you know, how much freedom is there to uh, speak up? So if, you, if your church would be very disturbed by somebody saying something yeah, that yeah. seems very random in the middle, um, that right. makes it a little bit less dementia friendly. Right, right. So I think if we really want to engage people and have it be a safe, welcoming space for them, there's changes we could make in mm -hmm. terms of the pace, the length of the service. How long Even, you have to stand. Yeah, absolutely. How long you have to stand. I mean, that's true for any elderly or other disabilities, which absolutely. I think the church is finally starting to, to be a little bit more sensitive to all kinds of disabilities, including mental, autism, yeah. autistic, and other issues as well. Yeah, I, I love that um, aspect of what you mentioned as well. Yeah, just asking, instead of asking, do you remember, mm -hmm. kind of set up, if I understand what you're saying, set up a, a frame like from the, a certain time of their life and get them to start exploring it. Yep. Yep. How you'd go about it. So I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't know how exactly how you get into that without saying. It's so easy to say. Do you remember? That's such yeah. a natural thing. Yes. So how would you? Yes. Like if you wanted to ask them about their childhood, how would you enter into that? Yeah. With someone who has dementia. Yeah. It would. It would. It's pretty individualized. So it would depend on how well you know the person. So if you know them and a bit of their story, uh, I think the easiest way to start without asking, do you remember, would be. Uh, I remember hearing a story about you doing these things. Um, that's a good way to enter in in a more gentle manner. Yeah. Say if you don't know the person, um, you know, you could simply just start telling a little bit of your story from a similar stage of life. Okay. Maybe how you became involved in the church or okay. what your faith story right, is. Right. And Whenever you started thinking about dementia or Alzheimer's, the first thought what about me? Is this going to happen to me? And how can yeah. I prevent it? Are there, you know, some newer thoughts you've had about, yeah. you know, Alzheimer's and dementia as it relates to prevention for ourselves? Or yeah. what do we know, you know, about it? Yeah, I think there's, uh, and I touch a little bit on this in the book, uh, thinking ahead and wondering if you're going to get something like Alzheimer's. I think there's there's two different P's for it. So there's the one that you've mentioned, the pre uh, prevention, and then the other is uh, preparation. Okay. You know, so what would you want life to look like if you were yeah. to have it, and right. how could you start to make those changes today? Uh, but in terms of the prevention, you know, again, there's no uh, foolproof method for preventing it. Really what we're talking about when we talk about prevention is delay. Uh, because if we could delay the onset of all that's really encouraging. <laughs> I mean, well, it is you, largely genetically marked, uh, I imagine, right? right. It, it has a genetic component, okay. um, but it is not largely genetic. It's not. It, it, it it's actually not. is okay. not, no. So if you do... Okay, um, that's kind of helpful a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it is. Uh, so even if you have a first-degree relative and even if you have a genetic risk factor for it, you still have a better chance of living out your days without it than you do with it. Really? Uh, okay. Yeah, the genetic okay. piece has been oversold in the general public, and... Uh, you know, without going into all the fine details of the genetics, there's one particular genetic risk factor called the ApoE4 allele that has gotten the most research, and it's simply another risk factor. And uh, there was just another study published this last week that highlighted that it, it is just one piece, it's and not actually, it means. is not. Yeah. It, so there's genetic risk factors and there's genetic mutations. Um, and if you have a mutation, right. you know you pretty much are going to get it. Okay. Uh, and is that something they can test with the chromosome? Yeah, they can test all of that. Right yep. Now. Yep. Uh, although uh, it's not typically recommended for Alzheimer's because the link is not that strong okay. and because there's nothing you can do to uh, right. prevent the onset at that right. point anyway. Uh, but the factors that uh, promote that are really sort of common sense living. Um, so good cardiovascular health mm -hmm. is good for the brain. So uh, hypertension, diabetes, heart problems no uh, are no vaping. Jerry might be out. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but good heart health, uh, card uh, cardiovascular health, physical exercise is associated with lower risk, uh, intellectual stimulation throughout life. So doing Sudoku or sort of whatever you say it, crossword puzzles, <laughs> yeah. learning a foreign language. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I've, so, I've long heard bilingual. Yes people, especially from childhood, yes. have lower rates yep. of dementia, is that true? Yeah, I mean, the general principle is anything you can do that challenges the brain. Okay. Uh, so when we learn, we form new connections, okay. we have greater synaptic density. Uh, those things look to be a protective factor yep. by okay. 
increasing our cognitive reserve. Because it is holes in the synaptic network, basically. Is that correct from things we've talked about in the past? Yeah. yeah, so you get two microscopic sets of changes, plaques and tangles, and what they do is uh, some of them form between the connection in that space between uh, neurons okay. um, and interrupt that communication, okay. those connections, but they also cause the neurons to die. Hmm. So there's two different uh, mechanisms there by which that can occur. Um, so forming new connections prior to the onset, yeah. a more dense uh, set of connections is helpful. What about after onset? Have you been able to find, are there studies that show that you can sort of delay it, I guess, or is it, is it kind of yeah. too many factors to control, I guess? Yeah, not so much um, delay it, uh, but those same factors actually look to be influential yeah, well, in sense, terms then, of the yeah. continuum. Yeah. Let's talk science and epistemology for a minute, because mm -hmm. you and I have had some great, mostly fun, or always fun, but uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes fun sparring on this. I, I don't think we're really in different places, honestly, probably on this, but no, I, I think, it, think, I think it's good yeah. to um, think about the epistemological issues of science and faith, mm -hmm. and you, know, you can make it as personal as you want, but as you yeah. think about your work mm -hmm. in neurology and psychology, um, just integrating that with your understanding of the complexity of what the human is, brain versus yes. mind, the soul. I mean, yes. It's a big bunch of stuff, but just any mm -hmm. thoughts on ways you'd want to articulate your... Yeah. I think what it made me think of, uh, you know, first was what um, that scientific training uh, mm. when I was in graduate school and, and deeply immersed in it, yeah. uh, the challenge that posed to me when yeah, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, in terms of, uh, in terms of my faith and, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, many people ask me about, uh, being a Christian in psychology and whether yeah. there are all sorts of tensions there and they certainly are. Um, but what I found was most challenging was not, you know, the theories of Freud and so on, right. um, you know, who have a less than positive view of religion. Right. Um, but it was uh, the introduction of a way of thinking yeah. that had to be evidence-based. Yeah, right. And so no one said to me, how could you believe in God given that there's no scientific evidence or anything like that, but yeah. there was a way of evaluating everything as it pertains to psychology as to whether it had empirical yeah. evidence And you get not. trained in a whole, it's a whole way of being yes. intellectually. Then, yes. Right, yep. So what I found was it wasn't that anybody was directly trying to chip away at my faith, although there were a little snarky sure. side remarks here and there, um, but they were equally directed at Christians and Freudians. You know, yeah, I mean, yeah, anything yeah. that they didn't feel had an adequate yeah, evidence yeah. base was fair game. And uh, but uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, epistemology and the way I sort of found my way through that is, um, you know, in some ways I did feel a little. Uh, threatened by that because they sure. started to think, well, this is, we're clearly setting this as the standard for what we do and how we make decisions. Uh, if there's some sort of uh, double blind, empirically uh, supported, <laughs> peer reviewed <laughs> uh, piece of research evidence. Um, and really, what it came down for me was uh, I was not necessarily struggling in my faith, but I was trying to resolve this apparent duality in my thinking that oh, yeah. I believed something that was. Uh, hard to justify or uh, demonstrate, I should say, in, right. in the same way that I was doing right. things professionally. And it came down to a, uh, a supportive group that a pastor in Detroit had started. And, oh, really? Okay, I didn't know this part of your story. Yeah, okay. it was, um, so we were members of a small church uh, up in Detroit, and uh, this man had a sister who had um, gone on to do a PhD in uh, art history, actually. Okay. So a non-scientific field, but he felt as if you know, her story reflected one that she lost her faith in the huh. midst of this. And uh, he didn't want that to happen for other people, so he started this uh, group for people in our church uh, who were in some sort of graduate or okay. professional education. Wow, that's so amazing. Were, Three of us who were getting PhDs in psychology, there was a handful of medical students and a handful of law students, huh. and we got together on a Friday night once a month, and he had some reading where we engaged issues of faith, and um, it was just 
a real tangible reminder for me that uh, there were other ways of yeah. knowing beyond, yeah. uh, beyond a uh, peer-reviewed empirical study. Yeah. Uh, and it really helped me get through. Huh. And um, That's a really powerful testimony. In my world, one of the biggest areas in gospel studies right now is called social memory theory. Hmm. I don't know if we've even talked about this We haven't, much. no. I'm um, eager to hear about it. And a friend of mine who's on, who'll be on the show as well, Chris Keith, he's one of the leaders in it. He lives here in town. Hmm. And it's uh, there's a lot of complexity to it, and I don't want to misrepresent it, but I think the shortest way I could describe it is it's a recognition that memory is socially constructed and mm. comes from the present. So in other words, rather yeah. than an older model that would say, that would kind of view memory as this thing that's stored in us that then we can retrieve or not retrieve, mm -hmm. the reality is that memories are things that we individually and especially corporately, socially, mm -hmm. um, generate now to make sense of the past. Yes. And they're deeply embedded in interpretation because all history will affect history itself history retelling there's no way to, to have non-interpreted history yeah which is an area of my own study in the gospels as well and social memory theory is kind of tapping into that and recognizing and, there, and there's a spectrum of ways people view it i mean there's a presentist view i think is one's called versus a continuous view the presentist view would be a kind of pretty radical postmodern version that would say there kind of is no past. All that the all that memory is is just our current mm. reproduction for our own purposes. Yeah. You can imagine yeah. that kind of Nietzschean kind of version of that mm -hmm. for power play or whatever. Mm -hmm. There is a continuist view, yeah. which would be more. Yeah, there were really things that happened, and but how we describe them now or how people describe them in text or something is still for their own purposes. Mm -hmm and has a socially conditioned element to it. It doesn't mean it's not true, it right. just it's recognizing there's a socially conditioned element and that's, yeah. you know, that would be, I'd be obviously more sympathetic to that. Yeah. So I'm yeah. just curious, like on the neurological side or the psychological side, if you do yeah. much reading and other kind of memory stuff and how that rings with you. Yeah, I mean, I think that that fits. I think the science of memory has, has grown to appreciate that. And I think that's uh, actually inspired by some of the science, yeah, yeah. that kind of understanding. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, the work of Elizabeth Loftus on, uh, you know, false memories and the extent to which you can uh, pretty easily convince people that they, mm. to remember something that never happened. And, uh, you know, that comes out of a whole wow. uh, politically charged, uh, debate about the myth of repressed memory, which was the name of her book. But, okay. but what her work really did in the scientific study of memory was to, uh, to highlight the malleability of memory huh. and the suggestibility of memory. And it really is a much more subject, uh, subjective, interpretive process like you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I actually tried it out on my son once, and uh, he... Uh, <laughs> We had gone on this uh, father-son camping trip when he was young, and, uh, and it, what I thought it was, we had this uh, camping trip, I think he was maybe five or six or seven, and uh, I, I told him, I was like, you remember that time, and then... You are a cruel father, psychologist father. I, I haven't even said what <laughs> oh, I did okay. yet. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, that sounds like a very thoughtful I took thing. my son camping, that sounds horrible. I mean, could you imagine? No, so we took this trip, and it was very meaningful for me. We connected, Yeah. and... Uh, you know, I said, do you remember that? And he gave me this sort of blank look, and it was pretty clear that he didn't. And then he tried to cover for it. And he said, oh, yeah, I do remember that. And then I said, well, I'm going to check this out. So I said, do you remember? Yeah, we, you know, we camped. We were at Otter Creek. And then do you remember those chickens? Those chickens got loose, and we chased them around. And uh, <laughs> he looked at me, he said, yeah, that was so fun. So uh, my assessment's that right. You are cruel. Yeah, that's that's my point. You're suggesting things, and then uh, you handed him the the yes. scholar's book and said, "Refresh memory." Yes, false that's right. Yeah. I said, "Read up and come right. back to me later." So yes, uh, but yeah. So I did mean, you ever? Is this your confession moment, or did you ever? No, no, I brought you, it up right you, away. Okay, I said, right. "No, no, there were no chickens," but but we did have a good time, and it meant a lot to me. So. Okay, okay. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's true, and so. He, even in the work that I do, when we think about conducting a life review or a yeah, life reminiscence, right. um, you know, especially working with somebody with dementia, you know, there's a lot of reinterpretation that's done, and uh, and mm. part of what we're doing is not necessarily trying to um, 
root them back in all the correctness of their story and the okay. correct facts, right. um, but to encourage them to uh, review their life and uh, emphasize key parts of their identity and their, their life story that are meaningful to them. And so if there's some repetition or they get something that's not quite right, um, usually we encourage people not to step in and yeah, say, no, yeah. that isn't how it happened. Right. Especially because uh, of the, the stress inducing of that for them. I mean, they're yeah. already somewhat aware probably yep. of their loss. Right. Sure. Yeah. This idea of what body metaphors you use to frame, or what metaphors you use to frame mm -hmm. the way we talk about the body. Yeah. And that there's been this trend in recent decades to think about, to speak about the body with computer metaphors. Mm -hmm. Like our brain is a hard drive or whatever. Yes. And the powerful influence that yes. the metaphorical framing has on one's perception of reality. Sure. And you, if you think about this memory one, you know, if we think of it in these kind of computer sure. terms, it, it's uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily a helpful way to, to frame what memory is, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think there's a, you know, I, I think there's a positive and a negative to those particular metaphors. I think, yeah. um, so I will use uh, actually that same metaphor in, uh, when I do a, education with families when they're mm. trying to understand uh, the person who is forgetting mm. um, because you know that hard drive metaphor you know if you think about if There's you some good in it. save yeah, a right. file on a computer right. yeah, it's yeah. there for later retrieval and uh, what I think I want to try to help families understand is that these new memories these new information is not getting stored. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so it and is there are the, holes being eaten in some of the old ones too. Yeah. That right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, much later in the process, but okay. early on it's as if the uh, files okay. don't save and um, so but always you know you talk about it as a file cabinet, you know, putting away these yeah. manila files in it. If they're not there, it doesn't matter how much you encourage or uh, berate the file cabinet, that that memory's not there. Right. Yeah. And so diagnostically again that gets back to what we were talking about earlier that yeah. The first thing that to go is short term, and so that's part of your diagnostic work. Is yeah. actually to yep. kind of do you remember what day it is? Do you know what happened last week? That kind of stuff. Yeah. So uh, not that that's conclusive. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Um, so it is that that is one of the more reliable indicators that we would use. Not necessarily day time. Um, that time orientation can be thrown off by a variety of different things. Okay. But remembering a list of words that you give to somebody oh, or yeah. giving them a short story to remember, you know, we got quantitative ways of looking I at what, how many what words people remember is okay. normal for yeah. 70, 80 and beyond. Okay. And, huh. uh, that's what we'll use. We definitely ask people about what day it is and what time it is and where they are. Um, but those memory for lists and stories and even visuals um, is a much more sensitive indicator. Okay. All right, if you look in that side thing, whatever that's called, overall, there's some envelopes. Mm -hmm. If you will choose one of those different colored envelopes and just choose one, okay. and there is some random question there. I don't know what's in there either. Okay. And if you'll answer that, and then I'll commit to answering the same question as okay. well. Sounds good. Let's see what's in there. Have you ever won any contest? Okay. <laughs> All right, uh, I have. I've actually won more than one contest, but okay. one stands out oh, more please. than the other. Uh, I was about 10 years old. Uh, I was very into drawing, and okay. uh, I wanted to be a cartoonist. I didn't know that, okay. Yeah, I was a, a big uh, Snoopy and Peanuts fan. Yeah, and, of course, uh, yeah. Actually wrote to Charles Schultz one day, and uh, he wrote me back. No and way! Sent me some hand drawings. It was really. Are, do you have the letter? Uh, I'm sure I have it at my parents. With some home. drawings, yeah. he sent you. Yeah. Dude, yeah. that's yeah. amazing. So anyway, that was my goal. He was my hero, and uh, that's the, awesome. Our, that was the contest, though. I mean, uh, that was just a letter, and uh, so our local library in the small town I grew up in had a, a bookmark contest. Yeah. And uh, so I submitted about 
11 different submissions. <laughs> Under different names? <laughs> no, all the same name uh, for this bookmark contest. And, uh, so and then he said, okay, fine, he's <laughs> put in 11, we'll just let him, give him yes, one of them so he'll yes. stop bothering us every yeah, year. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I showed up at the library and I just gave him a stack of bookmarks I'd had drawn and uh, they all had little book themes to them. That's awesome. A couple weeks later, I, I got the call from the library and yeah. to let me know I had won uh, by sheer will of force uh, <laughs> the bookmark contest. So that, that was awesome. a, it was a proud moment. They gave me a, um, uh, well, this is a nice full circle. They gave yeah. me a, uh, a gift certificate to Baker Bookhouse. Did they really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and you're in uh, Grand Rapids? Yep. In All Grand right, Rapids, of course. So, which is, I believe, who published your book, right? Uh, yeah. A few things with them. Yeah. 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 Um, I probably haven't won a lot of contests, but one that comes to mind, it's not really a contest to be more of a competition. But we'll, include that uh, in probably 1989 or 90 um, at Northern Illinois University I was the intramural singles badminton champion <laughs> <laughs> so yes. uh, my I grew up playing badminton my mom liked to play badminton yeah. and uh, in the street we didn't have a net so we would just play all the time I ended up playing a lot of tennis then as well but yeah. uh, but that was your I first was love. particularly yeah. good at badminton, I guess, yeah. and uh, hope I don't run, I run out of gas here. And uh, so, yeah, I played in college. There wasn't like a team, but I would play like at the rec center. Yeah. And uh, when you I walked won. in, they would say, "Here he comes! Here he comes!" I, I don't yeah. remember any of that, yeah. but I still have my racket because we play every summer at our house. We set up a net. I've got it was a Yonex racket that I bought 30 years ago, uh -huh. and, and that was, means. And it's still a great racket. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's a, you know, I paid a hundred dollars for it 30 years ago. It's a really nice racket. Wow. And, uh, that is a nice racket. Yeah. And it's still, I like, kill my kids with it. And every year, I think this might be the year where I, my one of my sons finally beats me. Um, but so far, no good. I can I can pull it off every time somehow. So. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. So that's my contest. That's good. By the way, this isn't a turn lane at all. Oh, it isn't? <laughs> How are you supposed to get in here then? <laughs> Just in case you saw my eyes get wide. Oh, is that why? Here. Yeah. Well I, well, I was almost going to pull out because I'm afraid I'm going to run out of gas. That was the yeah. problem. But anyways, yeah. well, dude, it's been awesome. Thank yeah, you thank for you. your time. And uh, appreciate it. on your work. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it, brother. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Three really quick things. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and connect with us on social media. We'd really appreciate it. Secondly, check out the comment section below. We've put a bunch of program notes and links to interesting things there. And third, check out some of our episodes you can see linked here. Thanks. We'll see you on the road. Peace.